Hello, and welcome to week seven of our Journey Through the Bible series. Tonight, we are going to be going over two books because for some of the weeks, um, we're going to discuss two books each week. We're going to combine that uh, for several weeks. We didn't want to make this series 66 weeks, so we're trying to combine some and get it down. I think we're going to end up with right around 40 weeks. So you will be seeing some weeks where we combine more than one book. Tonight we're going to talk about Judges and Ruth. We'll start first off with Judges. And it was written around 1400 to 1000 BC. The author is thought to be Samuel, but it isn't known for sure. The setting is um, the book of Judges takes place in the land of Canaan, later called Israel. God had helped the Israelites conquer Canaan, which had been inhabited by a host of wicked nations, but they were in danger of losing their promised land because they compromised their convictions and disobeyed God. So if you remember, you know, where we left off last week, we were in Joshua, and Joshua talks about how the children of Israel moved into the promised land and they were supposed to take it over. They were supposed to get rid of all of the other nations. They were supposed to um, subdue all of the paganism, all the idolatry, and they just never did that. They never uprooted all idolatry. And so we're going to see how that comes back and how it just, um, it's never a good thing for them. It is the thing that was their downfall every single time. They would get rebellious, they would move away from God, they would start having some um, idol worship where they were allowing in false religions and paganism, and we just see that same cycle over and over and over. So the purpose of Judges is to show that God's judgment against sin is certain, and his forgiveness of sin and restoration and relationships are, relationships are just as certain for those who repent. So God is full of mercy, but he's also just, meaning that he hates sin and he does punish sin. But when we repent, just like when they repented, he restored that relationship and he does the same thing today. So one of the key verses is Judges chapter 17, verse 6. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. So what we're seeing is a people without a leader. So whenever Joshua died, because you know, they had Moses and then they had Joshua. They didn't have a king. They didn't have someone that was keeping them close to God and that was drawing them closer to God. They had the priest, but they didn't have a singular leader that was in charge. You know, like Moses, how whenever they would start um, wandering from God, he would pull them back. He would uh, pray for them. He would talk to God on their behalf. He would pull them back in. And Joshua was kind of the same thing. Well, Joshua was gone. Moses is gone. So now we have this group of people who are pretty much ungoverned. So they became disorganized. They fell into idolatry and spiritual confusion. They started intermarrying with pagans, which God explicitly forbid. And they were a people without leadership. Judges 17 verse 6 that I already read, every man did, which was right in his own eyes. So it's like the people, they, they needed help and they needed direction from God. They, they had lost their sense of unity and their sense of who they were, who they were in God, who he had called them to be and who he had called them out and what he had called them out of. The tribes were scattered because remember there was 12 tribes that descended from Abraham. 12 tribes was the, the different tribes of Israel. And they were scattered and they were isolated from each other. They weren't all together as one people anymore. They had turned to Baal worship. They were worshiping a false god. About 350 years is covered in the book of Judges. And in this book, judges were chosen as leaders. So we learn about different judges. Some stayed very close to God, some strayed. And we learn in this book who they were, what their character was, and what happened to the people under their leadership. So that's what the book of Judges is about. The two leaders, Moses and Joshua, was gone, and next to come up was Judges. So we see the cycle. Idolatry is allowed, allowed in, falling away from God. They're punished, and then God's favor is removed. Then the people repent. They turn back to God. And God restores them. We see it over and over and over. So I'm going to go through just a very brief chapter overview. In chapter 1, we see the military failure of Israel. 
chapter two is when Joshua dies. So Joshua is gone. He's no longer there to lead the people. Chapters three through 16 is where we see that idolatry leads to servitude and the rescue of Israel by the judges. So God sends them in to say, look, wake up. It's time to come back to God. Do away with the idolatry. Do away with the things that God is against and come back. In chapter four, we see the story of Deborah. I love the story of her because so many people want to say that um, God doesn't use women and that, um, you know, women need to, well, I'm not going to go into all that because that could be a whole teaching all of itself. But many people just say God doesn't use women, basically, and that um, we can't be teachers and, and those types of things. In, in Judges, we see Deborah. She was a judge, which meant she led the entire nation of Israel. She led all of them. She was a prophetess, meaning that God spoke to her and she gave the messages for the people. And we can see through her example that God loves his daughters and that he does use his daughters. Now, I'm not going to get into all of the, the authority and all of those things and should women be um, head pastors and all that. There's a lot of theology there. There's a lot of beliefs there. What I'm saying is, is that we are not counted out in the working of God's kingdom. Women have a place and women have a voice for the kingdom of God and God loves his daughters and God uses his daughters. So in chapters 13 through 16, we see the story of Samson and Delilah. So Samson was, um, set aside for God and, you know, called into service for God, but he let his eyes get uh, um, full of lust and he started chasing after a woman named Delilah and she was his downfall. He was very strong and he was able to defeat Philistines, which they were against the Israelites. There was contention there. There was fighting there. And he was so strong, they could never subdue him. They could never take him out. They could never capture him. They could never defeat him. He would go in and wipe them out. And so here's Delilah and she keeps asking him, where is your strength coming from, Samson? Why are you so strong? Because in the story, we read how he was supernaturally strong. I mean, the strength that he had went beyond human ability. It was God-given strength. And he, um, God had told him to never cut his hair. His strength was from his hair and he, well, not from his hair, it was from God, but God told him not to cut his hair. And he was um, obeying God in obedience and not cutting his hair and those things. And so she keeps trying to trick him and saying, you know, where is your strength from, Samson? Where is your strength from? And he won't tell her at first. But then the seduction is just so strong that she keeps nagging and nagging and nagging. So finally he tells her, well, once he tells her, as soon as he tells her, she calls them in, the um, Philistines, and they take him out. And they cut his hair and poke his eyeballs out. And he goes blind and he has no more strength. And so we can really see so many parallels in that story and how we can get off track. You know, we can, we can have lust and it doesn't even have to be lust for a person. It could be lust for things. It could be lust for career or, or, you know, status or money or whatever it is. And it can so easily derail us from the things of God. We could be going about strong, doing what God's called us to do. And if we're not careful and if we don't guard our eyes, we can end up in a really big mess. So in chapters 17 through 21, we see the moral failure of Israel. So again, you know, they just did not stay true to God. They did not keep idolatry and foreign gods and paganism out of their midst. They never drove it completely out. They tried to cohabitate with it. And when we try to cohabitate with sin or we try to cohabitate with paganism, it never works out. It never works out. That's why we have to get it completely uprooted and get it out. So I'm going to talk now for a few minutes about what the importance of reading Judges is and some things that we can pick out as we are going through. <clears throat> so whenever a judge died, the people faced decline and failure because they compromised their spiritual purpose in so many ways. They abandoned their mission to drive all the people of the land out, and they adopted the customs of the people living around them. So instead of changing their, instead of changing the people around them for God, and instead of influencing them for God 
and like witnessing what we would call witnessing today and getting the people around them to follow God, the exact opposite happened. They allowed them to stay. They intermarried. They commingled. And it always caused the children of Israel to fall into idolatry and paganism and false religion every single time. They wasn't influencing their 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 um, community for the kingdom of God. They were allowing it to influence them and seep into what they were doing. So we can see the world has many rewards to offer those who compromise their faith, such as wealth, acceptance, recognition, power, and influence. When God tells us what to do it, what to do, we must obey it completely. So incomplete removal of evil often means disaster in the end. That's why I am always so big about house cleaning, keeping everything that not is not godly out of our homes, not watching it on TV. Well, that and that it opens doors to demons, but that's a whole nother story or a whole nother lesson. But when we allow compromise into our life, it's the first step towards a slippery slope of falling away from God. And it's really that easy. I mean, it usually doesn't happen where we just one day wake up and decide, oh, we're not going to serve God anymore. It's one decision at a time. It's one compromise at a time. It's one um, intermingling of things that we shouldn't be intermingling with. And it happens over and over and over. So in the book of Judges, we repeatedly see the nation of Israel sinning against God and a God allowing suffering to come upon the land and the people because of their disobedience. It did not come upon them because God was not just or because he was not loving or because he was not kind. It came upon them because they were in direct disobedience to God. There is always consequences for disobedience. Sin always has its consequences. Where there's sin, we can expect suffering to follow. Sin brings death. Sin brings suffering. Rather than living in an endless cycle of abandoning God and then crying out to him for rescue, we should seek to live a consistent life of faithfulness to where we are trying to remove sin from our life and we're trying to live obedient lives to God. If we can learn anything from the Old Testament, we can learn that God wants a people that is obedient to him, that is seeking to obey him. Something else we can learn is despite the efforts of Israel's judges, the people still wouldn't turn wholeheartedly to God. They did whatever they thought was best for themselves. The result was spiritual, moral, and political decline of the nation. They never sold out 100% to God. Never. They never gave their entire everything to him. They wanted to hold on to the things they wanted to hold on to. So in our lives, we can see that we will also experience decay if we try to do things our way instead of God's way. The best way that we can live is to surrender to God. If we want to be blessed and we want to walk in God's fullness, surrender is key. Surrender, surrender, surrender. And in that is obedience and getting rid of everything that God says to get rid of. Another thing we can learn is that God used evil oppressors to punish the Israelites for their sin, to bring them to a point of repentance, and to test their allegiance to him. There are times that God does test our faith, and he can use any situation he chooses, and he can use anybody he chooses. And they can be in our life as a test of our faith, to grow our faith, to stretch us, and to see, are we going to remain true and faithful to God? Rebellion against God leads to disaster. God may use defeat to bring wandering hearts back to him. He is a good father. And like any good father, he will do whatever it takes to bring people back to him. Because this life is just a blink of an eye in comparison to eternity. What the goal is, is to make it to heaven. And God will use whatever he needs to use to get us in right standing with him and to call our hearts and to draw us back to him. We also see that decline, decay, and defeat cause the people to cry out for help every single time. They vow to turn from idolatry and to turn for God, for mercy and deliverance. When they repented, God delivered them. He always delivered them. Upon repentance, he brought deliverance. Same today. You want deliverance from the enemy? Start with repentance. Idolatry gains a foothold in our hearts when we make anything more important than God. We must identify modern idols in our hearts, renounce them, and turn to God for his love and mercy. An idol is anything that we put above God, anything that has the number one spot in our lives. If it's not God, it's an idol. 
It can be career, it can be family, it can be marriage, it can be children, it can be status, it can be ministry. Ministry, it does not equate God. If our ministry is above God, it's an idol. It becomes an idol. God has to be in the number one spot. He will not accept number two. He will never be second. We can also learn because Israel repented, God raised up heroes to deliver his people from their path of sin and their oppression it brought. He used many kinds of people to accomplish this purpose by filling them with his Holy Spirit. Because back then, the Holy Spirit, he would put on people or in people for specific times. The Holy Spirit lives in us. When we come, come to Christ for salvation and we enter into covenant with him, Part of that is the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us and dwells in us. It wasn't like that in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit would would be given to people for specific um, situations at specific times. So now we can see that God's Holy Spirit is available to all people. Anyone who is dedicated to God can be used for his service. We have to realize that we can do nothing in our own power, but that we need God's guidance and power. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit. We need to rely on his teaching, his guidance, his conviction, his training, and his power. When we are weak, he is strong. When we decrease, he increases. We need to be increasing because I don't know about you, but in my life, I need more of God. I need less of me and more of him for every single interaction, every single action, every single day. Everything that I'm facing, I need more of God and less of me. We also learn about Gideon in the book of Judges. And he was um, fearful to go into battle. He put meat on the altar and fire from heaven burned it up. Then he asked God for a sign from heaven as if the fire wasn't enough. God graciously provided another sign through a fleece that was on dry, that was dry one day and wet the next. Gideon had to learn that it was by God's strength and strategy that battles are won. So Gideon was fearful and he was God. He was going into battle and he asked God for a sign if he was going to win or if he wasn't. And then he asked for another sign. Like he wanted that reassurance that God was going to come through and God offered him a sign and another sign. And you know, God is gracious. God was gracious with him and he showed him that he was with him and that he was going to do what he said he was going to do. So we may not fight battles against people with swords like Gideon faced, but we are in a battle against an enemy that shoots fiery darts at us. The Bible says in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. So we know we're in a battle with a fight with demons. They hate us. They want to destroy us. So we can't win this battle in our own strength. We need God to fight this battle against the demonic forces that come against us. The rest of the scripture says, but Jesus came to give us abundant life. So we know that the enemy is fighting us, but greater is he that is in us, which is is the Holy Spirit, than he that's in the world. When we turn our battle over to God and we use the authority that he has given us through Jesus Christ, through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we have authority over the enemy. The word of God says we trample on them. They belong under our feet. We can walk in victory against the the demonic forces, but we can never get it twisted and think it's in our own power. It, It is not us. If we tried to go up against the enemy on our own, we would get whooped every time. We can only face the enemy because God is in us, because his spirit is in us, because of his power and the authority that he gives us. So things to think about as you read Judges. What have you learned from Judges about carefully listening to and obeying the command of the Lord? What have you seen about the consequences of doing what is right in your own eyes? What parallels do you see between the sins committed in chapter 17 and 21 and today? What does this tell you? You know, I'm reading the Old Testament through <clears throat> right now or in my Bible, where I'm at in the, the Bible reading plan I'm doing. I'm in the Old Testament and I have been for a while. And um, I see so many parallels to today's world and the and what was going on then. As you're reading it, Notice that. Notice how much of it sounds like things that are happening today. And notice in your own life what parallels you see. Think about why the cycle of sin wasn't broken in the days of the judges. And then think about are you caught in any cycle of sin in your own life and what would it take to break that cycle of sin? What have you learned by studying the lives of the judges and what lessons can you apply to your own life? Okay, now we're going to talk about Ruth. I love this book. I think that this is such 
a cool story. And we can learn so many lessons from this one. We can learn so many lessons from all of them. I shouldn't even have said it that way. I just really like this book too. Okay, so Ruth was written sometime after the period of Judges, which would be around 1375 to 1050 BC. The author is unknown. Some think it was Samuel because of the writing style in 1 Samuel is identical in language to the book of Judges and Ruth. Also, it was his style to teach from the history of his people, so it may have been him. The purpose of the book of Ruth is to show how three people remained strong in character and true to God, even when the society around them was collapsing. It shows us the kind of faithfulness, godliness, loyalty, and love that God desires for us. It also foreshadows Jesus, and we're going to talk about that. So in the Old Testament, everything points toward Jesus. You know, some people say, oh, well, I just like to read the New Testament because it's about Jesus. But if you've not read the Old Testament, you're missing it because it points to Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament points toward him. So we're going to run through the chapter outlines or the outline of the chapters first. So I want to point out um, to begin with that Ruth was not Jewish. She married into the Jewish family, but she was not Jewish. Naomi was her mother-in-law and Naomi's husband and two sons died. So you have three women. You have Naomi, who is the mother-in-law, and you have two daughter-in-laws. And all three husbands are dead. The father and her two sons, they died. So now you have left the three women. And Naomi wants to return to her people because they were not living in the land of her people. So she wanted, so her husband and her and her sons moved to a different land and they took foreign wives. They died and now Naomi wants to go back to her people because she's destitute. She has nothing. She doesn't have her family and she doesn't have any way to survive. So she wants to go back home. And um, so she wants, one of the daughter-in-laws goes back to her own people and her own family because Naomi told both daughter-in-laws, you go back to your families. I'm going back to my family. You two are young. You can remarry. There's no reason to stay with me. There's nothing I can offer you. I'm going back to my people. You go to yours. One daughter-in-law did, but Ruth didn't. She stayed, she stayed with Naomi. So that's the background of the story. So in chapter one, we see that Ruth remains loyal to Naomi. They go back to Naomi's country, to her, her city, her people, where she's from, and her family is there. <clears throat> In chapter two, we see that Ruth meets Boaz. So Boaz is a landowner and he has people out um, gathering the wheat in his fields. And traditionally they would allow um, single women or uh, widowed women to come and collect some of the wheat that was left over. But when Boaz saw Ruth there every day collecting uh, the 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 grain for her and Naomi, he said, let her have the best. So he told his his workers to drop some on the ground. So to make sure that she had enough, he even had her come set and have food with him. And he just, it seems like from the moment he's seen her, he just felt this connection to want to help her. So that's where we're at in chapter two. Ruth meets Boaz, who is a, a close relative of Ruth's husband, which was Naomi's family. Chapter three, Ruth follows Naomi's plan. So Naomi wants Ruth and Boaz to get married. You got to read the whole story. There's a lot of stuff in this that you may not understand because of the Jewish culture. I want to encourage you to research the Jewish culture around kinsman redeemer. When you understand a kinsman redeemer and you understand uh, what some of this stuff means, it makes a whole lot more sense. So what a kinsman redeemer is, is whenever a family member dies, someone in that person's family, like the closest relative, can marry their wife and keep the land in the family. Because remember God allotted plots of land to each tribe. He told them how to disperse it. He told them how to pass it down through the lineage. So all of these things were already laid out by God. So this was how God had kept the the land and the bloodlines going. So whenever Ruth and Boaz meet, Naomi wants Boaz to marry her. So in chapter four, 
<clears throat> we see Ruth and Boaz are married and Boaz becomes her kinsman redeemer. So here's something that's really cool. So Boaz was the son of Rahab. Remember when we talked about Rahab a while back? She was the prostitute that protected the two spies of, of Israel that went into Jericho to spy out the land. And she then was the only one who was saved. They got her and her family out. And then she was taken in to the Jewish, the, the Jewish family. That is Boaz's mother. So he was the son of Rahab. She married into the Jewish family. Boaz and Ruth had Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, which was in the bloodline of Jesus. So when you read about the story of Boaz and Ruth, you are reading about the bloodline of Jesus, which Boaz was the kinsman redeemer. And we can also see the parallels to Jesus being our kinsman redeemer. He came in and redeemed us. And I just think that's so powerful. Boaz redeemed Ruth and we have a redeemer in Jesus Christ. And it flows from the same bloodline. Think of how Jesus acted on your behalf as your kinsman redeemer by becoming a man so he could break death's hold on your behalf. And by becoming a man, he broke that death's hold by paying for, you, for your sin and my sin. Remember that we weren't redeemed from our life of sin with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, a lamb without spot and a lamb without blemish. And I just love that story because I just see how it parallels to Jesus and how he rescued us and he took us and he, he adopted us into the family. We became part of the family and he redeemed us. So I want to talk now a little bit about the importance of reading Ruth. So Ruth is faced with a choice, either go back to her country, Moab, or go with Naomi. But not only did she choose to stay with Naomi, she chose her people and her God, and she made the right choice. This is a reminder of how so much can hang on one decision. You know, we're faced with decisions day in and day out. Every single day we have decisions all over the place. Some can seem really insignificant, and we may not even realize it at the time, how much um, weight they can carry in our lives. That's why we need to be led by God, and we need to make sure that we're making godly choices and, and godly decisions. The next point is when we met, first met Ruth, she was a destitute widow. We follow her as she joins God's people. She gleans in the field where she's given the um, grain, and risk her honor at the threshing floor of Boaz. In the end, we see Ruth becoming the wife of Boaz. This is a picture of how we can come to the faith in Jesus. We begin with no hope. We're rebellious. We're aliens. We're no part of God's kingdom. We are on the outside. We're not part of the family. We're not part of the children of God. <clears throat> we're his creation, but we're not in relationship with him. Then as we risk everything by putting our faith in Christ, God saves us, forgives us, redeems us, rebuilds our lives, and blesses us with a blessing that will last for all of eternity. Boaz redeeming of Ruth is a picture of Jesus Christ redeeming us. Sometimes I think we really need to just set with everything it means to come into relationship with Jesus, everything it cost him, and the weightiness of being in relationship with him. The next point we can remember is faithfulness. We can, we can think about faithfulness as we're reading this book. Ruth's faithfulness to Naomi as a daughter-in-law and friend showed her love and loyalty. Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz were faithful to God and his laws. Throughout the story, we see God's faithfulness to his people. It's like everywhere you look in the book of Ruth, you see faithfulness. Our life should be guided, guided by faithfulness toward God, to be loyal and loving in relationships with one another. And also, we must imitate God's faithfulness in our relationship with Him and with others. We should allow faithfulness to be our guide in how we interact with people, how we treat them, how we see them, and then how we interact with God. We must be led by being faithful. Ruth showed kindness to Naomi. Boaz showed kindness to Ruth. She was a despised Moabite woman with no money. Remember, she wasn't one of them. She came into that, that area and she was not Jewish. She was not one of them. But God also showed his kindness to Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz by bringing them together for his purpose. 
we need to show kindness. We need to be kind to people. How many times do we see fighting and bickering and backbiting and backstabbing and just flat out hatefulness and nastiness and ugliness? We need to be kind. We need to be compassionate. We need to be considerate. We need to be gentle. We, we need to be loving. We never know what people are going through. We never know what people are facing. And, you know, we, we, can, we have a choice every single time we interact with people. We can show the love of God or we can rip people to shreds. And we really have that choice. You know, sometimes I think, because I know how I used to be. I used to fight with people all the time. I loved a good confrontation. I never, so um, after I went through, yeah. So after I went through domestic violence, a switch flipped in me and I said, no one will ever step on me again. No one will ever victimize me. No one will ever step on me. I made a whole lot of inner vows that were ungodly. You, you hear him right there. No one will do that. And I was the type of person, I went from zero to 5,000 in about 0 0.0 seconds. And if I thought somebody was even looking at me sideways, I was ready to verbally confront them. I did not mind confrontation. Sometimes I looked for it. And I would shoot people with both barrels, you know, just my words. And I was cutting and I was hateful and I was nasty and I was ugly. And that was something that God really, really, really did a work on me in and changed. You know, now there will be times that someone will verbally attack, or not verbally, they'll attack me like online. I don't normally get people verbally attacking me. Um, don't really find myself in those situations. But someone will attack me online. And my flesh wants to just give it right back to them. But then I hear the Holy Spirit say, no, <laughs> no, let it go. And what he really started showing me is, what does it matter? What does it matter? Not anything at all. I'm not going to change their mind. I'm not going to bring them closer to God if I just, you know, blast them. What does it matter? It can be about political stuff. It can be about um, the things of the Lord. Now, I never, never, ever, ever go easy on my faith. I never backtrack. I never... Um, don't talk truth, but I don't engage in fighting. That's one thing I will not do. I do not engage in back and forth. I don't. I will talk all day long to someone who has legit questions. If they have legit questions, and I've done it, I've I've been in messenger with people for hours. No problem doing that because they have legit questions and they are seeking God and they want more of God. I will sit with them as long as it takes to answer whatever questions they have. But if someone is just being snarky, they're being ugly, they're being nasty, I'm going to disengage. And that in and of itself is using kindness and wisdom and moving on. Backbiting, fighting, bickering, um, all of that, all it does is make the world look at us as Christians and think, I don't want none of that. We need to really watch how we treat each other. And we need to watch how we treat people. You know, if we see someone who's in sin, telling them they're stupid, telling them that they're really dumb and won't they wake up, who is that going to bring to the Lord? Who is that going to wake up? But when we can lovingly tell them truth and lovingly tell them about Jesus Christ, that has a chance to change. That has a chance to wake them up. That has a chance to minister to them. But when we are calling them names, when we are belittling them, we are no better than the world. We are actually allowing the enemy to use us to run them further away from God. And when the church is in social media fighting and bickering and doing all that, we're allowing the enemy to, be, to use us as well to say, Ooh, why would I want anything to do with the church folks? Look how they fight amongst each other. So we really need to watch what we do and what we say. The next thing that we can see in the book of Ruth is integrity. So Ruth showed high moral character by being loyal to Naomi. By her clean break from her formal land and customs and by her hard work in the fields, Boaz showed integrity in his moral standards, his honesty, and by following through on his commitments. So just as the values that Ruth and Boaz lived by were in sharp contrast to those of the culture shown in Judges, so should our lives stand out from the world around us. Others should know that we are Christians without us having to tell them. I always say the world should not have to squint and look real close and try to figure out if we're followers of Christ or not. 
We should be different. We should stand out. We should be different. And not because we're telling them we're different. They should be able to see it in our actions and in our words and in the way that we interact, the way that we carry ourselves, the things that we say, the things that we don't say, the places we go, the places we don't go, and how we love people. And we should operate in truth and integrity. If we're having to tell others that we're a follower of Christ because otherwise they didn't know, then we need to examine how we're living. If I have to go around announcing that I'm a Christian and don't nobody around me know it, I got a heart issue. I got a heart problem. There's something in me that needs fixed. And there were probably a many times in my life before that maybe people didn't know it because I allowed my temper to just be like that. I was critical. I was bitter. I was hateful. I was nasty. I was ugly at times. And people around me probably didn't know. The people that I went off on, they probably had no idea that I was a follower of Christ unless I said I was. That's not what we should look like. We should be walking by the fruit of the Spirit. People should be able to see us and see God shine through us. We are told to shine our light. Let our light shine. That means we're different. That means we are sharing Jesus Christ with those around us. And we don't have to beat them upside the head with it. They should be able to look at our lives and just by watching our lives see that we're different. But the things we say should definitely be different. We should share him. We should talk about him and those things. But I'm just saying our actions should be different as well. So we see God's care and protection over Naomi and Ruth. He keeps them safe and secure. They came to Bethlehem as poor widows, but they soon became prosperous through Ruth's marriage to Boaz. Ruth became the great-grandmother of King David, the lineage of the Messiah. So no matter how hopeless our situation may look, we can trust God to take care of us. His resources are infinite. We can believe that he can work in the life of any person, whether that person is a king or a stranger in a foreign land. We can trust him to provide for us, no matter what it looks like. We can trust him. So some things to think about as you read Ruth. What have you learned about loyalty from the story of Ruth? What does it mean to be loyal to God, to his people, to his precepts, meaning his word, and to trust God to do what he says he will do? The final verses of Ruth show us that Ruth was included in the genealogy of David and therefore in the human lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only did a sovereign God include the harlot Rahab in the genealogy of his son, but he also chose a Gentile. Think about that. In the lineage of Christ, and if you understand like the Old Testament, how miraculous it is that a Gentile was in his lineage. Both of these women cho- chose to believe God when those around him didn't. Consider how their example might apply to us, to you, as you read. In the book of Judges, Israel forsook the true God and turned to idols, while in Ruth, the opposite is seen. One Gentile woman turns from idols to serve the one and only true God. Wow, how much we can learn from her story. I hope this has blessed you. I love, I, I love getting in the Bible. I love talking about it. I love sharing about it. If you all have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Message me, comment it wherever you see the video. You all be blessed.